So how many of you know what Simply Test Me is? How many of you use it? Okay, cool, cool. Um, so we're going to talk today about Simply Test Me, and you know, all of you are our target audience because the whole goal is to lower the barrier to Drupal contributions and the learning curve and that kind of thing. Um, we did recently change the way our website works, so we're going to talk a little bit about the future of the project, what we're currently doing, and then a roadmap moving forward. Um, there's three of us. There's Matt, there's Adam, there's me, Amy June, title camel case, always one word. Amy June, please. No, not my first time. Um, so I am a community person. I work on Drupal contributions, but I am, not to be reductive, I am not a coder and I'm not a programmer. So when I got into Drupal in 2016, I worked for an agency where I audited modules and I did simple tests on the code and stuff like that, but I could never figure out how to get a local environment going and I discovered the Simply Test Me project. So I am passionate about the Simply Test Me project from a non-coder, non-programmer point of view, not only because, oh, well this is what we're going to talk about today. I'm one forward. Um, you can see we're new mission, the history, Drupal 9, um, our new framework, Tugboat, feature directions, and then um, plenty of questions at the end. But going on about the, 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 the vision and the mission is because I'm really excited about Simply Test Me because Drupal is hard and creating a local environment, you know, six years ago was even harder than it is today. So having this framework built where I didn't have to have an environment on my machine, I could have a browser-based URL that I could spin up in five minutes, test, make some configuration changes, share it with the team. It really helped me get into Drupal development. So the idea behind Simply Test Me is, you know, to create this browser-based environment, um, not only to evaluate and install and test out these Drupal instances and modules and, and uh, installations, but also it works in the issue queue. So you could spin up an issue or spin up a site paste a patch and be able to test a patch and know whether or not it worked within five minutes. And that's spectacular for someone who doesn't spin up local environments, you know? Um, so, um, the last thing I want to comment, and this isn't something that's maintained, there's a project called Dreaditor, and you can use it sometimes in Firefox and sometimes in Chrome, depending on the day of the week and how the internet is feeling. But you can download this extension, and it injects some buttons into the issue queue. Um, so if you don't have Simply Test Me or Dreaditor installed, it looks a little bit different. But you can see that now we have the Simply Test Me button in our, in our issue queue, thanks to Dreaditor. And this is a really nice thing because, you know, I mentor and I help people get involved in Drupal contributions and they don't have a lot of time, you know, they have five minutes, they have a couple hours a month, that kind of thing. They go into the issue queue, they find something with a patch, they can hit this button and would five minutes be able to test it. It's like a really spectacular thing. The review button and the embed button are Dreaditor related things that don't have to do with Simply Test Me, but that button works wonders. So, <clears throat> you know, Adam took over the project and he's gonna talk a little bit about when he took over the project and how some of the values changed, but really it comes down to, and I say this a lot, lowering the barriers to entry. Drupal is hard. So, not only for contributions, but the learning curve, you know, to be able to spin up and understand how to use a contributed module figure out some of the configuration in the admin UI and on a throwaway site. Um, so it, it definitely, you know, uh, the learning curve goes up and then it, the, the, the barrier, because some people don't have a machine that is capable of having a local Docker environment, you know, so there's all kinds of reasons why people can't have these local environments. So it actually increases the inclusivity of people who can, who can write code for Drupal, who can contribute code for Drupal. And then it's a community project, you know, so we have this project that all of us in the community can use. We use it at DrupalCons, we use it at contribution days. Um, we, we 
have teams of marketers that can put together landing pages and show a URL across 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 you know the world, um, and then most importantly, you know, it's that tenant of being free. You know, it's open source. You can see the code. You can look at it. You can look at the framework if you want. You can do something new with it. You know, and. I'm the contribution community person, so I want to talk a little bit about how we all can contribute because it's very exciting because you don't have to be a coder to contribute to Simply Test Me. Anyone can contribute to Simply Test Me. We have a community project on Drupal.org where we give people community credits and incentivize the, the, the contribution process. We have a dedicated Slack channel in Drupal Slack, Simply Test. We are in there every day. People report issues. People are, you know, we have an issue queue for issues, but sometimes they're just like, hey, is this really happening right now? So there's a lot of conversations in there. We talk about what we're doing moving forward. Um, in contrib workshops, you know, we are promoting the get pod and the merge request stuff, but there's a lot of patching still going on. So it's a tool we utilize when we mentor people because again, First time contributor workshops, do we want to spend three hours setting people up with a local environment or do we want to set them up for success and have a five minute spin up and test a patch? And then um, Google Summer of Code is something we've done in the past. Not sure if that's going to be something we work on in the future, but that was something that you know we helped elevate and um, we reached out and made sure that we had um, different sorts of people contributing to the project. And that's another really important lesson in our community is when we did this new framework, you know, we utilized the skills of marketers, designers, programmers, and people who use the product. And it's really that case use of everything in open source and Drupal that everyone has something to contribute and everyone has something to learn. So um, we can talk more about that at the end or you can like ping me and figure out how you can contribute more. But Adam and, and and Matt are going to talk about the future and where we are and what's going to be next. Okay, so um, we're going to talk a little bit of a history lesson here. And uh, it has been a long road for uh, this project, and we'll get into it, but I think we are in a really good place now. Uh, so, for, for some of you history buffs, at least uh, some of you have been around in the community for a long time, uh, this project really came to be very shortly after Drush was launched, just to give you a kind of a, you know, a benchmark. And it dates back to 2012. Uh, I had to go to the Wayback Machine to find the dates. Uh, you know, always love uh, doing that. Uh, and we found some good gems, like you could see a screenshot from, you know, I think it was like late in 2012 of when uh, Simply Test was launched, and you could see uh, it had a very minimal set of features, there was no patching, there was no uh, anything like that, but it had its basic search uh, capability and the ability to launch a sandbox. It was created by uh, Patrick D., uh, Patrick Drotloff, and uh, to give you a kind of a benchmark also, it was released kind of between like the Drupal 6 and Drupal 7 days, okay? So roughly in that space and time frame. And, and it was really kind of before a lot of like the DevOps movement started and automation and things like that. So in my opinion, it was actually way ahead of its time uh, when it was launched. Uh, and it was a really valuable resource, I think, to help uh, community members really uh, hit some of the goals that Amy June was covering. So um, this is a pretty technical slide, but uh, the flow kind of makes sense. And when we look at the early architecture, again, there wasn't a lot of infrastructure as code. There wasn't any DevOps. There wasn't virtualization. There wasn't cloud computing. These were kind of really, really, really early days of when those things were kind of coming about, right? So Simply Test Me basically was a fully custom built system. And it had multiple servers. They were bare metal servers. One was for the web server, and then we had what we called the back-end servers. We pulled information from Drupal.org, from some of their APIs back when uh, some of like the XML feeds were created on Drupal.org, as an example. We're, again, we're really dating ourselves here. Um, and, but we had you know, this like web server front end that ran a Drupal site. We have these worker servers that were on the back end. They were load balanced with this custom logic and this Nginx routing and all kinds of fun stuff. 
And uh, we made use of, um, uh, in the really um, early days before containers were really kind of taking off, uh, Simply Test Me actually used LXC, which was a precursor of Docker, and was routed with HA proxy. So again, like when this was created, this was very much ahead of its curve, okay? And extremely modern and extremely innovative. Uh, and it worked out really, you know, I think it was great uh, for the time. But times change. As the system went on, the technology and the community, cloud computing, virtualization, containers, Docker even came about, Docker Hub came about, all kinds of things changed and it evolved. The whole technology space that this played in evolved, including DevOps, right? So Simply Test Me became very fragile and very dated by the time I took it over, basically. And uh, when I took over the project, it had, you know, uh, Patrick was, you know, ready to move on. Uh, it hadn't, you know, systems hadn't been updated. New versions of uh, Drupal hadn't been installed on Simply Test Me. Uh, lots of bugs, lots of problems going on with it, right? Uh, but it had an extremely heavy maintenance burden, right? When you're having like bare metal servers that haven't been updated in several years, those systems were going down all the time. Logs were filling up. Uh, you know, it was it was really crazy. And Simply Test Me is not just an open source project. It's a service. So we had a very heavy footprint of actually running and maintaining that for the customer service, believe it or not, right? People would ping us and say like, hey, this is down, or hey, this isn't working, and this thing isn't going, uh, and it was pretty chaotic. Uh, and there was lots of system administration and lots of updates. It wasn't keeping up with some of the newer uh, Drupal versions and some of the newer tooling, and uh, so it was a little, little bit crazy. Uh, I love the image in this, by the way, because it's like it was perfectly summarizing kind of like the state of my mental world at that point when I took over the project. It's like, hey, keep this system running, but uh, it needs to be fixed. Uh, and I'm like, no, I'll just keep fixing it. Uh, but I really, I knew deep down that we needed to do something much more drastic and, and modernize it uh, far more than it was. Another major limitation back then was we actually had no development servers. So anytime that we were changing stuff or building stuff, there was a very high likelihood we were taking down the systems as we were doing it, uh, which is really wild. Uh, we also had no contributors uh, uh, in the whole ecosystem of Simply Test Me, except for me, and we had no money. So it was about the worst kind of circumstances you can kind of take over, uh, but you know we try to make the most of it, right? Uh, so then a new maintainer came, and that's me. Uh, and Patrick D decided, hey, I, it's my time to move on. I'm ready to like do other things, and you know. Um, but for me, uh, I talked to Patrick and I said, hey, I really want to preserve the community aspect of this. I want to make sure that it continues to be open source driven, uh, that it's maintained. I have a vision for where I want to go in the future with this. And in 2018, I uh, took it over, and my goal was to continue to honor what he set up at the beginning of the project. Uh, and try to make it better and improve upon it. So I set on this course for, uh, I call it revitalization, right? I'm um, like, we will build a new, you know, chart a new course. And so uh, I had a lot of goals. Like I wanted to make sure that it was easier to maintain, more actively maintained. Amy June came in and really started helping with marketing. I set up an open collective so that we could actually raise funds from the community and pay people to do work, which I believe in. Uh, Centaro actually paid for a whole new feature called one-click demos, where you could click on a button right on the UI and it would automatically spin up a site uh, you know, right away. And um, the folks from Tugboat, which we'll talk a lot more about later, uh, basically set up um, our ability to completely remove all of our uh, worker servers behind the scenes. They were extremely fragile and replace it with a, an ephemeral container-driven infrastructure, which was awesome. So uh, that was the kind of initial scoping of this revitalization, and even since then, we've done significantly more. So this section I call our new Simply Test. Um, I'll start with a few and then pass it over to Matt, who is gonna get into all of the technical weeds the great news here is, I want to start by leading with this, is about six to eight months ago, I think. How long has it been now? Someone help me out. Uh, it was last Monday. 
last winter. Okay. Okay. Okay, so I was wrong. All right, so it's been over a year. Uh, we launched an entirely rebuilt Simply Test Me from the ground up completely. And this was, I remember the day that we felt it was ready enough to launch, right? And I like pushed the button to switch over the DNS from, you know, the old uh, servers to the new one. And it was like this huge sigh of relief. It was like, yes, we did it. And so this image of like the ship it, I'm like, yes, we shipped it. It was so cool. So some of the tenants though that we were looking at with where we went is we really wanted to kind of get more into the agile space and leverage a lot of the new and modern DevOps philosophies as part of this, right? So if you, if you kind of look at what Simply Test is doing, it is kind of like a CI CD system, right? It's automating deployments. It's, you know, you define what you want. It's using a lot of infrastructure as code. Uh, but it, it's very similar in practice and in principle to what a DevOps system is doing. Uh, and it's using now a lot of uh, ephemeral infrastructure with Tugboat and everything like that. And uh, Matt really came in to help uh, establish this like really good microservices architecture that uh, helped kind of build a lot of interoperability between our front end and our back end systems. Uh, and so it was a really, really good fit uh, as we were going forward. But the main goal that we set out to do whenever we built the new version was we wanted to completely eliminate all of the nonsense maintenance that we were doing because we believe we can add more value for the community if we only focus on the application, right? If we hit that and everything else is automated under the hood, all the maintenance, all the you know, systems, all the servers, et cetera, this would actually position us to focus only on adding value for the community through the Simply Test Me application, right? So this was our like mantle as we were going through this exercise. We uh, had a lot of, uh, and I know Anna Laura is here, I don't think she's in the room, but she's at DrupalCon. If you see her, give her a big thumbs up. Uh, she did a whole new design for us uh, and, and spec'd out a whole refresh visually from where we were. And if you remember the screenshots early on when you saw on the slide, this looks a lot different, right? And she really cleaned it up. She did an excellent job. She did like mobile mocks and everything like that and, and kind of cleaned everything up in this. And we have a whole new design. We built an entirely new theme, fresh look and feel. We actually added features even with the new theme. We did a usability test at MidCamp like years ago on this design. We added a couple things that we thought people wanted. And so uh, major props go to uh, Iris Abekwe. She works at Civic Actions and Anna Laura who uh, is definitely, you'll see her around uh, the conference. So, um, and then what we did, uh, so we do honor our open source roots, right? And we're doing that a lot through the application. All of the code is open source and everything like that. But I, I think one thing that we always kind of juggle in our minds is like, well, we know that like, you know, vendors and uh, you know, are, they're kind of offering things that we could benefit from as a service, right? And so we opened up an RFP to basically uh, allow any community partner to bid on our pass web server because we didn't want to maintain the underlying servers, right? So we opened that up. We uh, expected it to be a sponsored thing. We had a committee. We reviewed all the submissions from the people, uh, the companies that submitted for that, right? And uh, we chose uh, Amazie Lagoon. Uh, it hit all of our needs with uh, CICD and a lot of the maintenance things. They also have a really cool edge layer and a good logging feature that we just uh, are kind of gradually turning things on. So it's been a really nice uh, thing for us to do because uh, it allowed us to completely replace a legacy server that we were maintaining by hand it uh, offered some really good features for our own development to be able to spin things up in more of a rapid development approach. Uh, and then uh, it also helps too because um, it's a standard, right? Like many you know, people have used the system before. So it actually helps to kind of lower the barrier for anybody that might want to help us or configure us, uh, that part of the system. So it worked out really well. And we got things like SSL certificates and edge balancing and logging, uh, which were major gaps of what we had to do manually before and we kind of get it a little bit more for free with this type of an offering. So it was a good win for us. Um, even though, you know, again, we do try to focus a lot on open source, but this is an example where we felt pretty strongly we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. All right, I'm gonna be turning things over to Matt. 
uh, when we did a lot of this, we set up a Drupal 9 system. So I'm going to give it to Matt to take over here, and he's going to talk a lot more about the technical bits for that. Hey everybody. I also wanted to mention about Lagoon. What's cool is they are now, I believe, Amazie's Lagoon is part of the CNCF, the cloud network, whatever, whatever that is. It's like the cloud foundation, which is really cool. Um, so let's talk about Drupal 9 and the new front end. Um, it drastically reduced the architecture um, because we could use OOP in Drupal 9, and we also decoupled the logic for the form into React. Um, because I don't know if anybody has ever gone down the rabbit hole of nested forms. My work with Drupal Commerce and Checkout, I have been to the seventh layer of form API. And being able to move that logic out of Drupal's form API into a JavaScript framework, which is reactive, it, it helps improve that we could write just backend code there. And also um, leveraging Tugboat. So uh, one thing I want to mention like with Tugboat, honestly, Simply Test at its core isn't that hard of a piece of software on paper. Take inputs, build run file, push it to service that runs it. And if anybody here has used Kubernetes or Cloud Run with like the cloud, like modern DevOps, right? Docker file, boom, runs it. But as you start going down and down and down, running, running that is quite hard. Let's see what's the next one. Okay, so the Drupal 9. So let's go into the more technical bits and I'll expand on some of that. Um, so said form API is very verbose, it has limits. As said, with like the address module, I don't know if many, most people have experienced working with the address module. But right, you pick a country and then you get the address format and all that. Now imagine that form three layers deep and Drupal Ajax has certain limitations that you just cannot bypass. For instance, a select list in Ajax can refresh your form but does not update form state. It must be triggered by a button. Otherwise, Drupal forgets itself. It has a little bit of amnesia and your form breaks. So to be able to build a form that lets you pick your main project, additional projects, apply patches, what version of Drupal core is the Umami demo supported because before it wasn't in 8.5? And what if you want to patch your additional projects and then we need to add merge requests? That's a lot that we have to manage. So being able to abstract that into a JavaScript application just made it more, well, it's still hard to manage, but it's, it's separated from Drupal's form API, which has its own complexities. Um, so it allows to have that robust form with all the nested options, um, and it, just the business logic. So if somebody is a JavaScript like expert, well, they're just managing state, right? This form needs to build this object and send it to an API request. That's the contract. And then the PHP site says, I received this, and I transform that into a run file. In this case, it's a Tugboat QA build form. And, I mean, it could be like a Docker file, it could be anything. But the front end doesn't care. It just knows it needs to build this payload. Um, so that has made it more maintainable. I want to add, having a reactive front end was critical for this project because of the experience it offers to you know all of our customers, right? So if you pick Drupal 10, you don't want to see things that are not related to Drupal 10. You don't want to be able to select options that aren't there. You don't want to be able to pick projects that aren't oh, just wait. That's supported. Yeah, so. yeah, that's one thing. We reinvented Composer. Well, we didn't reinvent Composer, <laughs> but the front end, if you pick a module that doesn't have support for Drupal 10, you can't pick Drupal 10 as a version. If there's a module, like let's go back a year, that didn't support Drupal 9, this allowed us to have an endpoint that said, given project and this branch, what compatible versions of Drupal core can I run with? Um, so we have that additional projects to, there might be a bug, but technically you shouldn't be able to add an additional project if it does not have a compatible version with the version of Drupal core you've picked. So we have all that kind of semantic versioning resolving in our APIs as well, which the JavaScript made a lot easier to handle. Um, <laughs> benefits of the coupling. So, oh, this is the cool part too. Um, so launching the sandbox is now just a data definition contract. So I don't, who here knows about the type data API in Drupal core? One, who likes to play with it and has gone down deep and used it beyond the entity API? All right, I know you have. Um, so I'm a big nerd about the low level APIs in Drupal. It's pretty amazing. And essentially just the type data API, um, if you used the rest module, you might have seen it. But it just lets you say, this is the schema of an object or of an item. Think of it how like we have primitive types of string you could have a string data definition, and that allows you to attach constraints to it, such as the symphony violation or symphony validator package that says, hey, this string is actually a URL, and it must come from HTTPS, Drupal.org, or 
drupalcode.org so we can have a v validation on patch URLs to make sure they come from a trusted source. And that we don't have to write custom code, well, it's custom code, but we don't have giant if statements that say if this payload is here, we build it in the data definition and we let Drupal just roll with it. Um, so that has streamlined the validation. Um, the original code before I jumped in, well, so I was wrong, a year and a, about a year and four months ago is when I jumped in and we launched it about six months ago. It was in the fall, I think. Yeah, I thought I was right. Um, so when I jumped in, like there was some port for the D8 code, but it was a lot of if this, else that. So moving it to a data definition reduced the whole incoming payload to just take the JSON request, decode it to JSON, pass it to the type data manager, validate it. If there's an error, tell the front end, hey, 400 bad requests. If not, send it to Tugboat and complete the request. Um, so type data is pretty cool. If you're ever interested in it, talk to me. I'm a type data nut. Um, it's a very low level API that does power everything in Drupal and is one of the unique parts of it. Um, here's an example of that. So hopefully simply test me as an open project can help show you use cases of these more obscure parts of Drupal core. So here this creates a property definition for the payload. So we have the project, which is actually a project info definition, um, the Drupal version, which is a string, um, the install profile, manual install, and additional projects, which is actually a list of project values. So you can get really nitty gritty in here. Like I have issues that say Drupal version, so to also check our database of Drupal versions to make sure that you didn't pass in like fake values. Um, same with um, like the install profile. Is your Drupal core version one that supports Umami? Those are still some hard coded pieces of logic that we have in JavaScript in the back end because it was just easier but eventually I'd like to consolidate. Or you can help contribute to consolidate, <laughs> I should say. And then this is the response. So we get to decode, we pass it to the type data manager, we validate it, and if there's issues, we kick it back. So it's, if you are writing APIs in Drupal, please use this as an example. Like let's say JSON API is not work, you need something custom, use this as a reference. Like that's one reason I was really excited to write this is there isn't much of this in the wild. Um, so optimizing and refactoring. So Tugboat had some really great, when Adam took it over and set up Tugboat, Tugboat reads from a repo, and that repo has to have a commit that pushes. So in the back end, there's a GitHub repo that had 450,000 branches that I finally pruned down to 79,000. Uh, so it would make a branch, it had the GitHub SDK, and it would go call the GitHub API to make a commit, a branch, the commit of the file that would trigger Tugboat and like all these extra like steps. Um, but Tugboat had API improvements that we were able to leverage. We don't need to do that anymore. We can say, here, here's our base ref, here's our config in the API request, send it. We don't have to make a commit on GitHub anymore. That was like a thousand lines of code removed. It was yeah. big, it was like one of those happy pull requests for like, we deleted a lot yeah, of stuff. The red was like massive yeah. compared to the and there's, there's even more that we haven't taken advantage of. We use base previews. Think of it, if you're used to Docker, how there's like a base image that has the cache of all the things. Those still needed a branch to exist. And that would be based off of in GitHub. Now we can actually make a request for that. So this hidden repo that you all don't have access to to contribute these base can now live in Simply Test so like, hey, the base images need to have zip. This is actually an issue right now. We don't have the zip extension. Somebody can make the merge request that says all base previews should have the zip extension and on the next cron run, once it's deployed, we'll update our base images and we'll be all good to go. Um, so what the heck is Tugboat? So Tugboat is a pre-production infrastructure as code, um, IAC. It's a CI CD tool, so you make a commit, it builds it, and then you have an <clears throat> you have an ephemeral environment. Um, DevOps for all sorts of projects as a personal plug. For, I did a year on my own and every client I included this with their project because I don't believe in merging code until it's been signed off. Like you should have feature branches. And this way I could send it to the customer and be like, hey, how does this look? They give thumbs up, QA, boom, production on Friday and have a, have a mind time. Um, so to learn more, you could say, you could email them at hello at tugboat.qa or Jeremy's at James, not Jeremy, why could at the Lullabot booth, right? So at the Lullabot booth, you can talk to him about Tugboat. Tugboat was created at Lullabot and then is his own entity. Um, the Tugboat preview configuration. 
So I mentioned like Docker files here and there. It's not like writing Docker files. It's more like writing like your GitHub Actions workflow, Yet Manifest or Circle CI, Travis CI. It's like writing that. You have steps to install things. Um, so we are working to standardize the generation into like a config generator right now to make it easier to maintain. Right now, it builds a giant array of random commands that get kind of squashed together. And we want to find ways to make that experience easier so that way it's easier to contribute to that build step as well. It's a little, little hairy, but it's slowly getting there. Um, and one of the good things is it helps unify custom builds and the one-click demos because they were very separated before. Um, so now they... One-click demos are actually plugins in the back end, and I want all builds to be based on plugins that just override the setup commands or the install commands. So we are able to just use the same infrastructure, the same build steps for those. Um, so the new Tugboat API capabilities, I did go ahead of this then. So we can create the API, we can create previews over the API without making commits, removed a whole bunch of code. Um, like I said, now our base previews can be generated that way. And one thing that is neat, and kind of something that Amy June brought up, is technically Tugboat's not open source. So the project is open source, but integrates with the closed source project. With how this is being built, let's say a company wanted to run it internally. You could write, it's not there yet, but it could be made to swap the backend that runs the preview environments. That says, hey, launch manager, or we created our preview, um, or rather like, hey, launch manager, I invoked this submission, you could write your own code that says, oh, hey, here's to build the Docker file and launch it on my Kubernetes cluster. So um, the work with Tugboat helped decouple a lot of that from the legacy application, so that way you could write your own backend host if you wanted to. Um, improved build process tracking. Oh, who hit this 113% weird error whenever something failed? Because it went on for a while. So what happened is, the old system would actually ping back to simply test me and create like an entry in a log table of the status of what was going on. And in Tugboat that was happening, but when something went really weird, it would like spam pings and end up at 113% because there's more records in the database. So now what we've changed is we only have it at four steps, so it's less granular, but we actually just output data to the log and then read the log as it comes in. So as it's building, we try to give you a live preview of what's being returned from Tugboat. It doesn't track yet, it's got improvements to go. But it reads for our markers, and then updates the status bar like, oh, are we at the installing step? Are we at the downloading or patching? All that. Um, so the logs are streamed from Tugboat, and again, if you're interested in this, your, the, our API keys actually aren't exposed over that because we proxy it through Drupal and combine two API requests, in, like the responses, into one. So it's kind of like acts as an API gateway to Tugboat in that regard. Um, relatable, relatable code base. I said there's work to be done. It's working to become more relatable. We have this weird dance where it's an install profile, so it's on Drupal.org, but we need a website composer template that's on GitHub. Um, so that's where it's still a little weird to contribute to, but it's Drupal 9, it's OOP, it's JavaScript. It should be somewhat familiar and we're working on improving that contributor experience. Um, and then the future with Adam again. All right, thanks Matt. Uh, always good to dive into the technical bits. He cleaned up a lot of the stuff that I was working on, so I'm very grateful for him. Um, so one really cool thing is before DrupalCon, we wanted to uh, put on our best face for all of you. Uh, we did a pretty big sprint, I would say, the last couple weeks, right? And uh, we launched a whole bunch of new features and cleaned some things up uh, so that it would be uh, ready for all of your contribution here at DrupalCon. Uh, we fixed a whole number of bugs that were open, some project import things, some UI things that weren't quite clicking. Uh, we now offer Drupal 10 support, which is awesome, and uh, that can be ready for you all to get Drupal 10 ready uh, and core and everything like that. We now have more logging, so we can actually see a lot easier when things are not uh, going well on Simply Test. So we can get some insights and start to prioritize things a little bit better based on what we're seeing in the logs and the error messages. And uh, we're pretty close to uh, launching, I think, or getting close to it, uh, working towards it, uh, some better theming support 
where uh, you can more readily install uh, themes and have them kind of work more naturally on Simply Test, similar to the way modules kind of work. And theme, themes have a lot more uh, challenges behind it. It's not quite as straightforward as a, as a module. Uh, but we're actually working to get better about that, and I would expect that fairly soon. Uh, and where, what do we want to do kind of looking forward? Well, uh, Matt hit on a few with like the config generation stuff. We want to work uh, to get uh, more like base preview support, better cleanup, better automation, better abstractions to make the code a little easier to contribute to. Uh, we also have a lot of cleanup we want to do. I mean, we really jammed on trying to get it kind of going, but we want to refactor it to actually make it a little bit cleaner, a little simpler, better documentation in the code. Uh, and that's stuff we're kind of doing very iteratively as we go. Uh, but one thing that uh, I also want to do is I want to start being able to report out analytics from Simply Test Me, where anybody in the community could see how many projects are installed, if it's, you know, if people are installing Drupal 7, Drupal 8, Drupal 9, Drupal 10, uh, and also like be able to say, okay, these are the top projects, these are the top patches in these projects, et cetera, and kind of report out like all of the information that, uh, that is being used by Simply Test, which I think would be really cool for people to see like, oh wow, like this thing is, this project is the number one project used on Simply Test, right? Uh, it could even be good to submit things like, hey, you know, in an idea queue you could say, well, maybe this module should be in core because it's like the number one module that's used in Simply Test, right? Uh, and so I want to expose that information. Same with patching because I think, you know, when you have a patch, if it's not merged in yet, it could give you some good insights of like what Simply Test is seeing in terms of what people are trying to test. Um, and as I mentioned, we do want to have some more automated management with base previews because we want to make everything in the application. We want to store as much as possible and then have that drive most of the logic of what happens behind the scenes with the infrastructure. And a lot of that will be really helpful for ongoing automation, things like, you know, new versions of Apache comes out, a new version of PHP comes out, we can run our tests, we can do all of our automatic deployment, uh, you know, break, if things break, we fix it, we can clean it up. So we have all of that in place, basically. Uh, and so it should be uh, a much more streamlined and kind of automated uh, system moving forward. Cool. I wanna thank all of you for coming. That was basically what we prepared. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Uh, we all would, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's our, yeah. So the short answer is no. But right now you can create a diff. You can either do a okay. extension yeah. and just like that. Is that it? Yeah. Or okay. <laughs> this business is being recorded, I'll reiterate. The question is about <laughs> issue. Uh, merge requests. Issue forks and merge requests. Yeah. Um, so right now, we don't have a native way to say, oh, given this issue, select what merge requests are available. But what you can do is go to the merge request in the URL, type .diff, and that will create a generated patch for you that you can then copy-paste into the Simply Test UI. Um, it is on the list. There's just, you know, that's a decent workaround. It's not documented. So take that knowledge with you and share until we get it documented. But it's one of, we need to decide like what is the interaction? Is it you paste an issue and then you select for the merge request? Or do we just let you copy a merge request URL and we'll slap a dot diff on it for you? But for right now, just go to the merge request, type dot diff, get the generated patch that comes in, paste that into simply test, and it'll, it should work. So maybe that could be a good thing to test right now. It does work. It does yeah. work when you do that? Awesome. I think one other thing that, uh, and props to the DA for, you know, adopting GitLab and things like that, right? Uh, we actually have a lot of APIs that we have metadata that we can pull from, which is great because like, if we do want to make that experience a little bit better moving forward, uh, we have the ability to get the data that we might want, right? Um, it's a little bit tricky, as Matt said, like there's kind of like nuance to it, uh, and so we're kind of trying to iron that out, and it's very much in like an idea phase, but we would love to talk to people uh, to see if there's ways we can bring that home. Good question, really good question. And that's a segue into a good contribution of someone documenting that process of creating that diff file 
how they do it and you know adding it to the readme or something like that i love that idea uh, what other questions do you have yeah So it's extremely extensible, right? Um, it's, uh, Matt kind of used the analogy of like a GitHub action, right? Where you could basically run anything that you can on a standard terminal at certain events or certain times, right? And simply test me, the whole system, the Drupal application, basically just writes out what it is intended to do. Like if a user selects a project or a version or a patch, it writes the commands into that tugboat file that it produces its definition, right? And we have pretty much full control over it. Uh, you know, we have like base images, kind of like the Docker construct, right? Uh, we pull from that and then we script those on an individual basis uh, outside of that. So in my opinion, and I don't know if this directly answers your question, but it's highly configurable. Um, we can basically write anything that we want into that, okay, yeah. So we don't have this right now, but let's say you're testing the Redis module. We, this would be hard coded. I think we'd have to hard code this, but say, oh, you picked Redis, add a Redis service and install that extension for you. Same with memcached or solar. So we, by default, only run a MySQL service, but we could say, hey, have solar in it. You know, like I said, my clients that I had before, they ha I had the tugboat run solar and my SQL and Redis so we could see production. So we don't have that yet. I don't even think there's an issue for it yet, but technically we could even do that, that given these you know, service integration modules, add those services, the proper extensions, so that way when you install it, you can verify that works. I'm gonna open that issue right now. Okay. I think it would be a little hard to support everything, you know, and like no, from, from me being the, the pragmatist in all of this, I was like, we could write any service we want. Yeah, technically we can. Um, but it's one thing that to so also support it, and I'm a little bit leery of, of that. But we can, we can debate it. Um, Yeah, there's certainly, I think, some, some room to improve upon that. Uh, and one very relatable, uh, you know, thing that we struggle with perpetually is distributions, okay? That's why we created the one-click demo feature inside of Simply Test because it has its own definitions, right? And every distribution kind of has its own uh, ways and means of doing things, right? Like some use different parts of Composer, some don't. Like it's, it's a little bit of the Wild West, honestly. And so it's, there's no way for us to like universally support a feature like that in Drupal, right? So uh, we made the one-click demos, which actually can also imply to uh, the core install profiles, like Umami and things like that. So that's the construct that we use to implement that. But there's many things that are kind of like, you know, more complexities inside of some of these things, like the, the modules or the themes. Like we don't have, to give an example, right? We don't have like native NPM support to compile a theme, mm -hmm. right? So we're actually like looking into some of that type of stuff to make the theming experience a little bit easier, but it might only like, if we launch it at first, it might only support a few set of frameworks that are more predictable, like, hey, we're gonna install NPM and just look for certain heuristics, like a package JSON file and run that, right? So like there's, there's ways we're trying to ideate on making that a little bit smoother but no, we're not, like, our goal is not to hit every edge case. Uh, we want to make sure we're getting the big ones. We want to make sure that we're hitting the most popular uh, cases. But it is extremely hard to get every single thing because Drupal is highly configurable. The theming, the modules, you know, the libraries, et cetera. And it, it can be a little bit of the Wild West. Uh, but uh, it's something that we're trying to, to just make sure we get a lot of the basics uh, down right. That is that is native to some 
Drupal's module, like composer JSON type stuff as well, right? Especially for Drupal 8, 9, and 10. So like we respect that. Like if you go and load the module, right, using composer, like composer require, Drupal slash, whatever, it can go and pull down all of its code libraries and dependencies. And we're not um, doing anything that's off the reservation in that. So if it's using those conventions, it works fine. Now there are other things that I think are, are less common cases that no, simply test me is not like looking for some uh, more bespoke features in that regard. I'm thinking along the lines of like the old MIG files, Drum MIG files where you know there, there was, you could go to a module developer and say, look, it would really be nice if you would make a MIG file that then, you know, simply test me can pick up on and pull everything into if, if you guys had a standard way that you were doing through Composer or something. So yeah, yep. And we do have that, yeah. So for, for eight, nine, and 10, yeah, everything that's composer supported is usually fairly good. Uh, and it can be not just Drupal dependencies, it can be libraries or you know third party libraries. Um, Drupal make, or Drush Make was also what we looked for foundationally for Drupal 7, especially when we were trying to do distribution support in Drupal 7, a little bit easier in 7 than it was for eight, nine, and 10. Uh, and, but we did have some support for that as well. If you go back and look at some of our old code from our old system, you can see a lot of like these conditions of like looking for like the drupal.org make and like the project.make file. Like there was all these like conventions that were wired in, uh, but we're really trying to move away from, you know, kind of supporting that in a legacy construct. Uh, but, you know, um, I would say like the, the Composer Avenue covers many of those edge cases that uh, Drush Make was intended to do before, uh, but is doing it really for, you know, more of the Drupal 8, 9, and 10 stuff, yep. Hopefully that answers your question. What other questions uh, do y'all have? None? Cool, well thank you so much. Um, we will be here uh, today, tomorrow, so. Thank you for coming <laughs> and have a great day.